What's up? I don't know if I can stand behind a podium the whole time, so I can't. Do you want me to turn this one off? Sure. Okay. So it's important, it's important to note that for the, for the hard-on story, that um, I was sitting with my mom when this happened, and that went over like, like a lead balloon. And also, he was wearing that pin because he had donated to the American Heart Association, and so it was like all well and good, but the whole wait staff came out from the kitchen to ask where the pervert who asked about the guys. Anyway, are you guys okay to talk about diabetes for like a few minutes? Yes? Okay. So this is my hour-long talk that we're going to cram into 30 minutes. Good? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Is there a slide progressor? Oh, there's a button. I'm good. Okay. So this is my disclose a BD sort of slide. What's that? I'm good. So this is where I have to make some disclosures. Are you ready? This is the serious part. The first thing is tandem, blah, blah, blah. Send me a slide I have to put in for legal reasons. Have you read it? All right. They're very nice. They're not responsible for anything screwed up that I say. Disclosure, this is just more of that same outlining of the agreement. Did you read it really fast? Yeah. Tandem's nice. It's not my, they're not, I'm not their fault, right? Okay. <laughs> so that's my head. So my neighbor drew my husband and I recently. The kid's like 14 years old. And the picture that he drew of us was so horrific, like vampire sort of look. And I liked it so much that I wanted to use it as my headshot. So that's my head. Uh, drawn by my 14-year-old neighbor, and that's the book that I've written that I didn't title because it makes it sound like I have stuff figured out when I don't, and that's the blog that I've written since 2005. So those are like my digital street cred slides and my vampire headshot. You like? We're good? Okay. This is just a little bit of a disclosure, disclaimer sort of thing to cover my own behind. Anything I say is not medical advice. Obviously, it shouldn't be because I'm not a doctor, and I'm also from the internet, so that's not a safe place to get medical advice, uh, relationship with tandem, blah, blah, blah. But the last point is something I feel like I have to come out with because it's been something that I've kept inside for a long time. Do you know who Yanni is? He, wait, wait, wait. Look at this. I have loved this man for such a long time. I listened to Live at the Acropolis so many times that it like is embedded in my soul. And so if you are not a Yanni fan, you are totally missing out. But this is to inspire you to look him up on Spotify because he is on Spotify, he's that cool. So we're good with all like the awkwardness at the right. All right, so I've had type one diabetes for 31 years. I was diagnosed on September 11th in 1986. And it came after this really weird, so this is supposed to signify urine. And in most of my presentations, I talk a lot about bodily fluids in a try to be upbeat sort of way. But this is the P slide. So before I was diagnosed, my symptom was wetting the bed. Did anyone else have that symptom? All right, so but backing up a bit, did anyone's parents make them wear a P alarm? Do you know what a P alarm is? Oh, you in the back. I love you. So the thing was this device, and it had these two metal nodes that would connect on the inside of your underpants, and I'm seven years old at the time, and then it had this like little cable that came out, and it attached to a speaker on your hip. I wasn't diagnosed with diabetes, my parents just thought that I had a bedwetting problem, and they were trying to nip it in the bud. So in the middle of the night, if you started to pee, the two nodes would connect, and then this alarm would go off from your underpants, and rocket you out of your bed at two o'clock in the morning, and then you had to like run down the hallway to your parents' room and have them fumble around in your underpants to disconnect the pee alarm. And so I stopped wetting the bed, not because my blood sugars were under better control, but because I was scared straight by the pee alarm. So if you've ever, look it up, it made the worst noise ever. I had a video of it that I decided not to use because it's so, like I have PTSD as a result of hearing this noise. So pee alarms are a big thing. But uh, when I was um, diagnosed at the pediatrician's office, my blood sugar was 248. I didn't have this big dramatic diagnosis story. I just remember them saying, well, you have to go into the hospital. You're gonna stay there for 12 days. We're gonna teach you everything you need to know about diabetes, which I was game for because I didn't know what the word diabetes meant, so I wanted to learn more. So when I was sent home, they gave me a urinalysis kit. So I didn't even prick my finger that first week or two. And I didn't find out until later that my mom didn't want a, a glucose kit sent home with us because she wasn't equipped for that kind of data, which was like my first kind of look into what it was like for my parents to emotionally assume the burden of this condition because she needed to take this piecemeal, step by step, and blood glucose and pricking her kid's finger, she just wasn't ready for yet. So we had to start with peeing in the test tubes. Did you guys do this? We had to like drop in the little tabs and they changed color and if the test tube got hot you were in trouble because that meant your blood sugar was high but if it stayed cool then things were cool and you could like maybe have a snack do you remember this it was very gross to play with pee all the time but it was nice when we upgraded to blood these were the first chem strips that i used did you guys use these did you ever wipe them off with an alcohol swab to make yourself look lower so you could have an el fudge cookie just me 
And then, oh, I feel so bad using this slide, and I used it last year too, so just to emotionally prepare yourself for this. Oh yeah, who used it? Who loved it? All of, this thing was the worst. And it was like, we called it the guillotine, and it had the little lancet, who called it something other than the guillotine? You all called it the guillotine, because it was, it like beheaded your fingertip every time you chested your blood sugar. And this was a very stressful, awful thing. It made a terrible noise. This is like the actual size that it was. It was really stressful. Nobody liked using it. So when I look at the things that we have now, there's a lot of comfort and peace and solace found in that because the thing can actually fit in my hand versus that, which was a two-handed ordeal. So I'm glad that you guys have used this. It makes me feel less alone. Who shot up an orange to learn how to take their insulin? Who felt bad for that orange a tiny bit? Just a tiny bit. I always thought it was weird that they gave us this piece of fruit and they said it's the most like human skin, so it's really gonna help you simulate injecting an orange. And I can shoot up fruit all day long, but it's a completely different party to put that needle into your own skin. So, but this is what I learned in those first 12 days at Rhode Island Hospital. I'm in second grade, not wearing the pee alarm anymore, going home with syringes going into my body and the thing that I'm supposed to pee in to check my blood sugar. And this was diabetes back in 1986. I remember the guy that was the guy, he was 10, the little boy who was in the room with me, my like partner as I was diagnosed, he didn't have diabetes. And I remember that his name was Eddie and he had a spider bite. Some spider had bitten him on the thigh and it caused this huge like inflammation. So he had this very big physical symptom. Eddie was 10 and I was seven. And I remember sitting with him in our little hospital room, like comparing disease notes because I was new to what was going on with me and he'd never been Spider-Man before. So this was his first go around with that sort of thing. But he's like, well, this is where I was bit by a spider. I said, oh, wow, that's amazing. He's like, well, what's wrong with you? I remember going, I don't know. And so it was a very strange thing to think there was this serious business going on inside my body that was so invisible to everyone, even to me. I didn't feel any different, I didn't look any different, I just knew that everyone was interested in all my blood and pee, but I didn't know why, and we were all gonna figure it out. But for years, Eddie and I stayed in contact through our postcard. This is a postcard he actually sent to me, and it's, I think it's dated 1986, October 13th, 1986. And we communicated for years and years, this was before the internet, like the dinosaur days of communication, and we sent these postcards, but it just always left a lasting impression on me that like this moment of medical diagnosis for he and I, he got to go past his, and I still got to keep mine. And when I heard from him about 10 years later, it was like, oh, do you still have diabetes? I remember being surprised and going, yeah, I still do. I know, it's kind of a downer, huh? But so when I was um, put into the hospital, I didn't know anybody else that had diabetes. And so my parents got me this stuffed animal cat so that I could have my first sense of community. Did you guys ever have like a stuffed animal or a Cabbage Patch Kid or something that you gave diabetes to so that you didn't feel like you were the only one? Its name was Kitty. I was super long on imagination as a kid. But I would shoot this cat up when I took my own insulin. They would give me a saline bottle and I could jack Kitty all up with the, insulin, with the saline while I was shooting myself up. And it made me feel like I was less alone. And that was a huge thing for me because we didn't know what diabetes was. We didn't know what the word meant. It was something that we were trying to kind of organize our head around. And so to have something that was also doing what I was doing made a big deal to me. Obviously, you can forward face this and see that we're all in the room together. We all know what it, this is like. So like, you guys are like human kitties for me, which I really appreciate. But it's nice to have that community. And so then I was sent home back to second grade. Poor Mrs. Lamb, my, my teacher, had to figure out what to do with this child who had just been diagnosed, especially because Mrs. Lamb's favorite thing to do on Fridays was make milkshakes for her class. And so that got weird fast. But we went back into it. So it was about living with diabetes, about making sense of this new normal. And so we just kind of continued on with things. And I'm the one with the, in the front. My sister's the one with a bunch of hundies like in her pocket in there, so. But it was about continuing on after diagnosis. We had to figure out how to do it, make it normal, make it fun, but keep it healthy. Which brings me into explainabetes. So diabetes, as I've said many times, does not define me as a person, but ex explains a lot of the crap that I have to do or sometimes that my mom would have to do. So I told this story um, last year, but the, the summation of it is, is that I went on my first sleepover three months after I was diagnosed with type one diabetes. And I'd never been on a sleepover before. I really wanted to go to Jill's seventh birthday party. So I was so excited to go. And diabetes really didn't play a role in my going to the party, but it completely redefined how my mother had to handle it. My mom had to be best friends with Jill's mom immediately. Like she showed up at four in the afternoon to drop me off. She stayed until 11 o'clock at night and she was back at five in the morning so that she could check my blood sugar, make me pee in the cup, test my blood sugar, whatever it was she was doing. She needed to be there the entire time. And I don't remember what my mom was doing, 
because I was busy at a sleepover, first time, kind of awesome. But my mom was like, this has to be normal for Carrie. This has to be something that doesn't feel like it's impeding her from doing things. So I'm just going to have to basically sleep in Jill's driveway in order to make sure that diabetes doesn't affect me. And I really appreciated that. It kind of set the stage for making sure that life continued to go on. This is from diabetes camp. Who went to diabetes camp? This is kind of like diabetes camp for adults. But diabetes camp for me as a kid was awesome because instead of shooting up Kitty, who actually didn't have diabetes, I got to shoot up with all these kids who actually did, which I found amazing. So everyone at this camp had type 1 diabetes. The campers, the counselors, the staff members, the people that worked in the, in the lab, every single person had type 1. Every single person knew what it was like to look at a meal and look at it as math. Everybody knew what it was like to, I don't know, take syringes before breakfast. So there was that sense of community and belonging that was right out of the gate. And I felt like this was a huge turning point for me in my childhood with diabetes because it made it normal. When you are with people for the first time who do what you do and get what you get, doesn't it kind of like center you a little bit? to know that you're not the only one. Yes, this is interactive, so you have to be like, yes, otherwise it's weird. And also, just as a side note, there was this tree at camp that if you saw a little girl sitting under this tree with a jug of water, you felt really bad for her because you knew that she couldn't participate in the activities that day because she had ketones and she had to drink the gallon of water before she was allowed to play. This was the ketone tree. And I always thought that was kind of strange. This isn't the actual ketone tree because I'm sure they've cut it down. But it like kind of explained why, you know, she was doing that. Also, we tried to eat very healthy as a family. When I was diagnosed, things like, I've never had Captain Crunch cereal. I've never had Lucky Charms. These are things I've never, breakfast cereals like that were banned from our house. But I'm the middle child. My brother is six years older than me and my sister is two years younger than me. And they didn't have diabetes, so they didn't have to go and have everything banned from them too. So my mom got like sneaky. And she used to buy frozen broccoli, and then she used to take the broccoli out and put ice cream sandwiches in the frozen broccoli box so that I wouldn't find them. But the problem was, I always found them. And so it was like her best laid plans. No one ever had this happen to them. Your parents weren't like snaking candy into the broccoli boxes in your freezer. <laughs> this was normal in my household, this broccoli, was never broccoli. Also, purses were never small in my house. Like this was, this is, my bag is gigantic and th that is with reason because when I leave the house, I feel compelled to have everything that could save my life and the life of everyone around me. It's this weird compulsion. And so someone in a session was talking about the, the desire to carry a clutch and I'm like, I would love that, but at the same time, I have to have a bag big enough for us all to get into if there's a problem. And so, and that's dictated by diabetes. How often have you pulled a granola bar from the bottom of your bag that's been there for potentially six years and is covered in sand, but you eat it because you're low and you have to make that happen, right? It's gross Skittles off the car floor. You've all done it. Yes, you have. And so diabetes also explained a little bit of like the arguments that we used to have um, in my house. And so I told this story last year, but it bears repeating. My mom and I got into one of our only big mega fights over diabetes, and it had nothing to do with the actual diabetes part of it. My blood sugar was high. I lied to my mom about eating cupcakes. I feel like I'm a grown-up because I can actually say I lied instead of pretending that I didn't actually eat them, but I totally ate them. And when my mom was like, you're 385, you smell like chocolate. Why are you trying to tell me that you didn't eat the cupcakes? I don't know what it was about that situation that I couldn't own, but I bold-faced lied to her. And this was a big deal to her. She got so angry. My mom's not an angry person, but she got so mad that she kicked a hole into one of these things, like clear through it. And we had the rest of the argument with my mom's foot hanging out of one of these plastic blue bins. And it was very weird because I was like, mom is mad about something to do with diabetes. We called the blue bin incident. It was a very like marked moment. But she was pissed because I was not taking responsibility for my disease. And she was scared that this is something that I was going to continue to do and that life was not gonna be okay for me because I wasn't gonna own this huge part of it. So I had to kind of go forth after this and try to take ownership of this and try to find a little bit of levity and a little bit of joy in the thing that sometimes dragged me down the most. So I've really tried to do that and sometimes it's too easy. So like, have you ever heard of a low blood sugar described as a hypoglycemic event? <laughs> have you? No one gets invited. No one wants this evite. This is the worst invitation ever. But like, they used to call it this hypoglycemic event. Oh, you had an event, a hypoglycemic event, like it was a Christmas party that everyone got invited to. But it's not, and it sucks, and it's a party no one wants. But I remember thinking that was so weird. And then it kind of prompted me to think, you know, the way that we talk about things like diabetes, serious moments like low blood sugars, it sometimes is dependent upon who we're talking to. So for example, when I talk about diabetes lows to my friend, who's a nurse and she kind of knows what's up, 
I always describe it as like, yeah, I was low at two. That's why I keep juice on the bedside table. Can we get some coffee? I could totally use some coffee. It's very cursory, no big deal. Try to keep it kind of light, even though she knows the burden of that experience. When I talk about it with my husband, it's a little more like, almost like we're making a grocery list where I'm like, yeah, I was low. We've got to make sure we get the straw wrapper off the bedroom floor because if the baby finds it, he's going to eat it and he's going to choke. So, oh, by the way, we need to get juice boxes. Like, it's very transactional. Not, oh, you were sweating beside me in the bed for two hours last night because you were super hypoglycemic eventy, but more, we just need to buy some more juice boxes. And it's funny how we keep that at a very high level as well. It's different when I talk about low blood sugars to my mom. Because my mom, even though I am a grown woman with children of my own, my mom is still my mom and she worries about this stuff. Like she is always concerned about low blood sugars. She used to think that my blog served as confirmation that I was alive until she realized I could set posts to auto publish. So just because a post showed up didn't mean that I'd woken up that morning and that sent into her in a weird tizzy. <laughs> She'll like call me up when I'm traveling and try to be all casual about, you know, hi, did you watch? the show, I'm like, mom, I'm awake. She's like, cool, bye. And she just hangs up because she's just nervous. And so when blood sugars are discussed with my mother, I try to keep them very casual. I'm like, yeah, no, I was low. It was fine. That's why I wear a CGM. Stop worrying, mom. Like, just stop. Even though I know that's an impossible ask. When I'm describing lows to my insurance company, though, it becomes the most serious thing in the entire world because I want them to reimburse this shit. And so... You, know, you talk to them about like, I mean, if you read this, I'm trying to avoid a hypoglycemic event. You know, I don't want to have a seizure. I want to make sure that my CGM is covered and this is access and blah, 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 very important. So it's super furrowed brow sort of discussion. I don't normally talk about diabetes in that sort of way, but with the insurance company, absolutely. And then I completely switch gears when I talk about low blood sugars to my kids. They're eight and they'll be, uh, my son will be two next week and my daughter is eight. And so like they don't really understand what all of this is about, but they know that this is a permanent fixture in our lives. And so when they hear my alarms go off, first of all, they both have little songs that like are in tune with my Dexcom low alarm, um, which I think is cute and creepy. But uh, it's one of those things that when we, when we talk to them, we try to reassure them, yes, mommy's low alarm went off. That's why she steals your juice boxes. It's not because she's you know, trying to gank your snacks, but it's because she was a little bit low. It's going to be fine. And I've instructed my kids to know that what's my job, and it's not as an advocate, and it's not as a writer, is to take good care of them. And they know that the tools like CGM and insulin pumps and all this sort of stuff are the tools that I use to take good care of myself so that I can take good care of them. So it becomes very kind of, you know, serious, but don't worry, we're transitioning back to something a little bit different. So talking about lows is one thing, and lows are a thing that permeate my brain, like there's like a think a beady sort of thing that happens. So have you guys been in subways and trains and planes and that sort of thing? And do you ever wonder if any of these things break down, do you have enough stuff in your bag to sustain you for the next two to 19 hours, <laughs> right? But one of, my brain goes like to 11 on this one. And so a lot of times if I'm in a train car or a subway car, I will look at other people and totally project like, which one of them would I have to eat if I got that low? It gets super weird and very zombie-like. But this is, my brain immediately goes to that sort of stuff. That's the diabetes party things. Or like if you have to pee, which everyone does, and we're talking about pee again. Do you ever have to pee and you wonder, do I just have to pee or am I high, right? And if you have to pee more than once in an hour, or you know, you're like, well, wait a minute, this can't be because I'm super hydrated and I had 16 coffees. I'm clearly 300, and you're almost shocked when you check to find out that you're 84. But yes, pee is a different thing that I think about. And then, this is the puffy shirt. Though even when I see words like bolus and it auto-corrects to blouse, that is the most, it, this happens to everyone who's ever written that. I have sent my husband so many text messages that says, sorry, I just forgot to bolus. And he's like, you're not wearing a shirt? I'm like, no, oh, no. Like, that's not what I mean, but there's this weird diabetes autocorrect sort of thing that happens. It's super weird. And then, for ladies, I know, and you guys have already, I'm sure, heard about it. If a dress has pockets, it's the greatest dress in the world. And people without diabetes say that, and they do not understand how they are minimizing the pocket thing for the rest of us. This is huge. To be able to wear a dress and put your insulin pump in the pocket is an amazing feat, because then you don't have to shove it in your bra, and then, like, you know, it lights up when you bolus, and you become, like, Iron Man. Like, it eliminates <laughs> all of that sort of stress. So dresses with pockets are, I feel like, should be reimbursed by insurance. Yeah. And then there's that weird way that you look at food. And so a lot of my um, friends and colleagues who were diagnosed with type 1 when they were older and have a sense of before are like, what do you mean you look at food 
like it's a math problem. I'm like, well, yeah, like sometimes I just look at everything and think, how many carbs are in that? And then I take it again, like on the subway where I'm supposed to eat people, I take it to 11 where I'm like, if I had a bowl of golden grams, that's probably about 60 grams of carbs. But if I have a bathtub full of golden grams, like how many carbs are in a bathtub full of golden grams sort of thing? And you kind of fast forward it in that way. Or when you sit down to eat a meal, some people just eat hamburgers, right? And they don't think of it as, well, that's a fatty patty and that's like a bun with 60 grams of carbs and am I having fries or like it becomes this math problem. And so I never look at food as food. It's always this strange math problem that I sit down and calculate before I even have a bite. How much insulin is on board? Am I going to be exercising? Am I feeling stressed out? Is my pump connected? Am I just really, really hungry? And then no bike. Well, I'm not kidding. I'm not having the rest of it. And you only end up eating half of it. Like this is something that we do all the time, right? The weird food math. And people don't understand that. Like you can look at a granola bar and say that's 20. And they're like, that's a granola bar. You're like, no, that's 20 grams of carbs. How do you not understand what I'm saying? <laughs> it's a very weird sort of mental thing that we all do. But part of the other, I know. I'm going home in a couple hours, very excited. But, um, but part of the way that also I view my children is affected by diabetes. Like a lot of times I look at them and my children make, am I, am I being videoed? They're gonna be able to see this, aren't they eventually? Okay, so my, I love my children, I love you guys. Um, I love them very much and they are the lights of my life, but they make me insanely crazy sometimes because they can be so frustrating and so stubborn and they never shut up and I don't know where they get any of that from. But there's something about the diabetes stuff that adds a layer of kind of gentle perspective to things. Like, I don't know, if there's a certain issue with my daughter or with my son, I feel like when I look through the lens of diabetes, it seems slightly minimized. Oh, they took off their diaper and pooped on the coffee table? That's okay, it's worse, better than like having a hypoglycemic event that I have to invite them to, like sort of thing. Like there's a, an appreciation for them. And also they're the product of a lot of hard work. How many people in here have children? and are also parents with type one. It's, no, you can keep your hands up and down, whatever, but it's one of those things where when you are a mom with type one, no one really loves pregnancy. Anyone who says that they did is potentially lying, but it's this, this, this thing that gives you a product that you are so proud of and so happy about, and a lot of times when people talk about pregnancy, they talk about steel magnolias as though it goes hands in hand with diabetes. Yeah, you suck the oxygen out of the room with that one, right? Because it's just, that movie is horrendous. And that is the narrative that we're fed about a pregnancy with diabetes. And so when I look at my kids and I'm like, you guys are all right and I'm all right. And I feel like that is the kind of story that we're helping to reshape and retell for people. When people think about all those diabetes stereotypes, they're starting to think of us instead. No pressure. We are the ones, instead of referencing their great aunt Ethel, they're gonna be talking about us. And so there's something very powerful about what we have the ability to do. We're changing the way that society views people like us. Did you ever think about that? It's kind of heavy. And the next time you're on a subway wondering who you're gonna eat, you'll then think of how we're changing the perception of diabetes. And it's like this kind of magnanimous sort of moment. This is the conclusion diabetes. It's got an umlaut, so I think it's spelled correctly. But on the whole, I look at diabetes as something, like I said, it doesn't define, but it helps explain. But it's one of those things where it can feel all-encompassing and really overwhelming, and that can weigh kind of heavy on you. Are there times where diabetes feels like it's a little bit oppressive and kind of a big deal? Is it, or is it just me that gets a little stressed out about it and views it as this thing that's like a big cloud? No. So if it's something that you're able to look at as like not the whole of you or a hole in you, it's just this, this thing that is dragged along with you as you live your life. Like I kind of like that. I like the idea that diabetes is just a part of who I am, not this defining uh, uh, sort of all encompassing sort of moment. And I like when people see me as a mother or a wife instead of, oh, well, she's the diabetic one. Like I'm more into the other labels than that one. But at the same time, I have to recognize that diabetes is a huge part of who I am and it shapes so much of what I do and how I feel and the things that I appreciate that I think, and I hate admitting this, especially on tape, I think there are things about diabetes that I might have started to appreciate which is weird. And I feel like there are moments that I actually feel grateful for certain perspectives that I've gained as a result of this disease, which also feels weird because if you told me that you could take it away, I would give it to you with like no problem. And when there's a line for a cure, I will push everyone aside to be at the front of it. Like I'm not, 
the biggest fan of this sort of stuff, but I am appreciative for how it's made me view the other sorts of things. And the fact that we can all be in this room together, like diabetes does not define me and it doesn't define you, but it does happen to be the common thread, the anchor of this community that we can all rally around and be together through to know that we're not alone in this very, Sometimes isolating disease is something that we can experience as a group and go forth knowing that we are not the only ones who are dealing with these thoughts and these worries and these crazy thoughts, uh, that we can do this as a team. So if you guys, you guys are doing this next year, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, no pressure, but now you have to. And so <laughs> in those moments for the next year, when you're feeling like you might be a touch alone, you can remember that there is a group that is waiting to reconvene with you and swap supplies and glucose tabs and potentially buy you a glass of wine. Like, you have your team. And part of being on that team is also knowing that there is not an ounce of perfection found in any of this. There is no perfect, there is no constant 104 milligrams per deciliter like meter box advertisement all the time. We are all screwing up beautifully, constantly. And so it's important to give yourself a little bit of grace in knowing that you're gonna make mistakes, that you don't always have to know what you're doing. And so who was here last year and saw the dog? The dog slide, the space dog in the space suit. You saw that? Okay, I have a new one. This is. The, because I don't, right? This is one of those things where I feel like it's okay to be in this room and say, I don't know what I'm doing. I might be an expert in my own lived experience with diabetes, but there are days when I completely screw it up and I have no idea what I'm doing. And that's where I come back to folks like you to help realign me and set me straight. So collectively as a group, we can appreciate our uh, inability to do everything perfectly and understand that it's still gonna be all right. We are in this together as a community and it's gonna be fine. If you just remember the cat with the beanie, Right? Yes? Yeah. Wake up! We're all gonna be fine! So, but that's essentially the closing thing. So thank you guys very much for having me. And I will see you next time.